Good evening. Welcome to Freedom in Christ, Monday Night Live. A week ago, I was in Toronto. I uh, just had finished speaking to 650 pastors. It was a wonderful weekend in a great, great church, Church on Queensway in Toronto. Think about that. It had that been scheduled a week from now, wouldn't have been there, couldn't have gone. These are interesting times that we're living in, faced with the coronavirus, people uncertain what's going to happen next, creates a lot of fear and anxiety and depression and issues that we've been talking about now for about a year on this particular program. Uh, let me read a passage out of James. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and that. We don't know what tomorrow is going to have for us. We know that God does. And so obviously the conclusion should come from rational people. Better get in touch with him. One thing I think I can assure you for a fact, that the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot sustain you. I love the story in the Gospels where the disciples were in the boat and uh, and they were trying to get across the Sea of Galilee and the storm was there and and um, and they woke up the Lord. Don't you care? Aren't you concerned? And if I could just give a parallel to that, I said, you men of little faith is what he said. Do you really think if God is in the boat that you're not going to make it to the other side? If God is in the boat, if God is in your life, you will make it to the other side. Many years ago, when I was really just kind of starting ministry, I, was, I started out as a college and youth pastor, and, and I had this gal come to see me, made an appointment once a week. She was about a sophomore in high school, and she was really came every week with a bunch of questions that she thought she could kind of destroy my faith, I suppose, I don't know, but uh, I mean, she was acting kind of rebelliously and smug and and uh, and I just answered her questions and finally after about the fourth week, I said, wouldn't you just like to give your heart to Christ? Yeah, she said, and, and she did and and uh, and got all involved and just became a, you know, uh, very, very active in our youth group. Well. She had this program at school called Mentally Gifted Minors. And she wanted me to come speak. They had guest speakers come in and it was for a select group of kids who I guess they reasoned were a little bit brighter than others. And uh, so she, I said, sure, I'd love to do that and talk about my Christian faith. And, and every week up until that event happened, she said, oh, they're gonna chew you up and spit you out, you know, give you a hard time, whatever else. And, I said, well, don't worry about that. Well, I started to take it a little more seriously. I asked about the teacher, and he said, well, he used to be a Christian, you know, one of those kind. So I went there, I think somewhat prepared, and I was introduced to the class as the Christian. I found out later I had followed the atheist in uh, presenting to these young philosophers, I suppose. And uh, what I did was I gave them all four cards, blank cards. I said, here's what I would like you to do. I want you to just think for a minute uh, of the four things in life that you value the most. Four things that, that are at the top of your list, what you value, love, sex, <laughs> mom and dad, family, country, music, you know, whatever else it is, whatever comes to your mind, the four things. And I said, now, once they had finished, it took a while, I said, now, you had a crisis come into your life and you had to give up one of those. Which one would you give up? Take that card and throw it on the ground. Took a little while, but they did. I said, yep, you got it. Another crisis came and you had to give up one of those three. Which one would you give up? And they almost knew what was coming next and I sure, yeah, I said, another crisis came and uh, you have to give up one of those two. Take that card and throw it on the ground. And finally they all did. And I said, now look at this last card. 
what's on that card? If you can lose what you consider the most valuable thing in your life, you're leaving a pretty fragile existence, aren't you? I said, my last card says that I have a relationship with the living God and nobody can separate me from the love of God and God will never leave me nor forsake me. He's going to supply all my needs. Well, they didn't chew me up and spit me out. In fact, there was hardly a question after that as I shared how they could have a personal relationship with Christ. And I left a little track for them on the way out. I said, if you'd like to know how you could have that, here's a little track. And um, that was kind of fun to watch too because they'd walk by and kind of jerk their head up real quick like they didn't want to see other people looking for it. One actually sent a girl back in for one. <laughs> Asked the young lady, in our church, I said, how'd the teacher respond? And he said, uh, that guy made me nervous. <laughs> good, good. But how do we respond? In a crisis like this that we're going through with the coronavirus, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And at the time that we're having this talk, every day is a new normal. Every day you almost read the paper. No, no bigger crowds of 500, then 50, now 10 I'm hearing, and restaurants are closing. This is going to be a severe crisis. When you go through a crisis like this, it precipitates a lot of issues. What it really does, and we don't much talk about this, but it re really reveals the basis for your faith, what you are living by, what you believe. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, destroy it. It does test it. That's for certain. But people don't always live according to what they profess, but they actually do live according to what they believe. And uh, when a crisis like this happens, it exposes that. And you begin to see what it is that they're actually believing and how it works out. It's really interesting because over this whole last year now that I've been doing these videos and putting them up on, on YouTube so people can look at them later, because we went through a whole series on depression People are going to experience depression, folks. The number one cause for depression is a reaction to losses in your life. Could be death of a loved one, for instance, loss of a job, loss of a business. The way things are looking right now, there's going to be a lot of small businesses that are going to have to shut down for one or two months. Many of them can't sustain that. And we'll have to look for employment somewhere else. We don't know how this is going to end. We really don't. But but there's going to be a lot of problems with depression. There's going to be a lot of struggles with fear. We did a whole series on fear. Fear has an object. We fear things that threaten our safety and our sanity and whatever else. And the big three of that, which we talked about, is fear of death. And there are going to be death. This is, has 10 times the mortality rate than flu does. You know, I'm with you asking the same questions. It seems like we're a little over-concerned at this stage because more people by far have died from the flu and will die every year. And frankly, even the worst-case scenarios right now, more people die driving their car on the highway than probably will die of the coronavirus. And so, but we aren't doing anything about that. It's almost like we have acceptable ways to live and die and unacceptable ways to live and die. Uh, I'm not underscoring the seriousness of this because it is so progressive and it is so transferable. Uh, but we've never been here before. We've never walked down this path before. We've never had to deal with this, this particular type of a virus. I'm confident a year from now, science will come along and find a cure and, and it'll be a thing of the past. And it probably won't cause the casualties that the influenza crises in the past or the Black Plague of Europe, you know, centuries ago. And and so uh, I don't want to minimize it, but in perspective, uh, in, in one sense, it's not going to be the tragedy that we thought it was. But it is going to disrupt people's lives. And Paul says when he talks about the things that come and go, he should make sure that there's three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. Let me just be technical about faith for just a moment. Faith is everything. I mean, you walk by faith, you're saved by faith, you live by faith, it's required of a steward that they be found faithful. So there is no more important issue to, to grab hold of and understand what it really means. Now, what's interesting is that faith, trust, 
and believe all have the same root in Scripture. Faith is the noun, though, whereas trust and believe are verbs. And almost across the board, they're the same word in the original, but sometimes it seems more better to say trust. But it also brings the connotation of people say, I believe that, but do they really? Paul says, uh, James says, I'll show you my faith by my works. If you want to see what re people really believe, because everybody's living by faith, look at their life, look at their walk and their talk. It's a reflection of essentially what they chose to believe. And so people don't always, people make a profession of faith in God, but they don't live like it. Do they really have faith in God? Well, faith lived out is essentially is a trust, is an absolute trust in God. That's Christian faith. The object for the Christian is God. The object for the non-Christian is their own capabilities, government, medicine, whatever else. But the object of our faith is God. And, and, and once you lay that foundation, now last week we talked about the incredible promises of 2 Peter chapter 1, that God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He did that by making us a partaker of the divine nature. We're children of God. Now, he says, all that God has done, supply unto that your faith. Now, it has to start there because if your faith isn't right, everything after that doesn't follow sequentially. And so we have to have the rock foundation of faith. What is it that we believe? We believe in God. The only thing you can boast in the scripture is that we understand and know him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so the object of my faith is God. He's the perfect object because he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The, the best faith objects are things that never change. We can always count on them. We can rely on them. And so during a time like this, if we don't have that foundation of faith, then truth of the matter is the whole walk is going to be off. And it's going to reveal itself in all kinds of emotional problems. So it isn't just a, a pandemic of a, of a virus. I personally think you are going to see pretty much a pandemic of the common cold of mental illness, which is depression. Uh, the number one mental health problem in the world right now is fear. These are objects, uh, books I've written on and, and I've, I've reported on and these things. If you're if sequestered at home for two weeks, go back to YouTube and look at these because it's so important that we know how to deal with these emotional problems of our life. We just finished a, a thing on anger. And I said, much of the basis for anger is, is control or the lack thereof. Now think of the times we're living right now. How much control do you have over this? Almost none. The government has some in terms of responsibility, but in terms of our own personal health, it really falls back to just practicing good hygiene practices and watching where you go and cover your face and sneeze and you know have lotion and that kind of a thing, and uh, which you're going to get more and more advice on that from everybody who that's on your Facebook page, probably. But, uh, but what you do have control is your own personal responsibility. Now, let me look just a little bit deeper because we never really finished the series on fear on anxiety. And anxiety is different. You're going to have a lot of people fearing the possibility of death and fear of losing their job, this type of thing. But what we're really struggling with in times like this is anxiety because anxiety is like fear without an adequate cause. We're anxious because we don't know what tomorrow has. And it isn't like the Bible has been silent on that. In fact, passage I'm sure that everybody knows where he said, don't lay up your, for yourself treasures in heaven, uh, on earth, but treasures in heaven. And, uh, and he said, if your eye is singular, this passage is really teaching about a single focus concept. It, it, it's it's kind of hidden in a way, but in our book, we try to reveal how plainly he's talking about it. During times when you essentially are feeling anxious because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, understand something about anxiety. But the 25 uses in the New Testament, five of them are not negative. Uh, anxiety is, is something that we should experience when something is meaningful to us. Your teenager's two hours late, you should feel anxious. The answer is pray. Uh, if you've got an important exam tomorrow, there should be a little anxiety. The proper response is study to show yourself approved. You know, so don't think of anxiety as always necessarily wrong. 
Uh, but if it's properly understood, it should lead to proper behavior. But the word itself is interesting because merimaneo has comes from two root words, merizo divide nuas mind. It's a divided mind. And the antidote for that is to get out of that because the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Uh, I like what James says as it begins uh, in chapter 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. God gives generously to all without reproach and will be given him. But him him who ask, ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For this person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. And so you're lacking wisdom right now. God says ask. But trust that he's going to give you guidance during these particular times and what you ought to do to keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, and, and, and meet the needs that they have. But rather than think about treasures on earth right now, think of treasures in heaven. And uh, he said, because right now no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious. Don't be double-minded. And so this whole discourse that Jesus gives ends with, seek ye first then the kingdom of God. And so how do you get all that double-mindedness? You see the same thing in Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be double-minded about anything. But by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known unto God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to think upon that which is lovely and do the lovely thing. And so we have answers for these kind of issues. Now, what's God's answer for this? If you're anxious about tomorrow, he said, didn't I tell you about that? Look at the birds of the sky. Look at the lilies of the field. I take care of them. And you, beloved, are worth more to God than they are. If God will take care of those things, won't he take care of you? Therefore, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And so, as you see a crisis like this, it's going to test your faith. But it doesn't wreck it. <laughs> what it will do is put a, a test on it. And it will drive us back to say, am I going to run around be tossed in here by the wind and the sea, or am I going to find the stability and, and whether my faith is on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, the foundation that God has laid for us. And uh, you look at, at, at fear and the fear of possibility of dying. You know, we answered that one for you, folks, and you ought to come to a point in your life where for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Where, O death, is your sting? All that would happen if I died from the coronavirus is I'd be absent from the body present with the Lord. Now, that is not a license to commit suicide, by the way, because God is required of us to be a good steward of the life that God has entrusted to us. So I'm going to be a good steward right now as best I can. As a father and a grandfather, I'm going to do what I need to do to assume that kind of responsibility in taking care of my own family. That starts there. Uh, anxiety... However, it doesn't seem to have an adequate cause. We're anxious about tomorrow. So somehow we have to say, okay, God, I'm going to live a responsible life today, and I'm going to trust you for tomorrow. One of the things that we do when we lead people through our steps to freedom is we have two appendix. One is on fear and one is on anxiety. We've already talked about fear. But what do we do when we feel anxious about something? How do we you know, become single-focused and single-minded and, uh, and cast our anxiety upon Christ because he cares for us. Actually, one of the number one drugs that is sold out there is to somehow temporarily cure anxiety, anywhere from alcohol and whatever else. I said, don't go there, you know. They don't care for you. The bartender doesn't care for you. The drug dealer doesn't care for you. Uh, the one who cares for you, the one who really cares for you, is God himself, the one who loves you unconditionally. And so uh, we have a little process that we just kind of work through people. I said, number one, just state the problem. State it clearly. A problem well stated is half solved. I've had people come in my office in the past with a, with a problem, and I keep asking questions and asking questions. And after a while, they clarified what the real problem is, and they said, thank you, you helped me very much. In one sense, it didn't help them at all. But what I did help them do was to clarify the problem. People are not anxious about facts. They may be fearful, 
but they're anxious about what they don't know. And so unfortunately what happens is they start making assumptions. Have you ever noticed something? People don't assume the best. You know, your teenager's two hours late. Oh, he's probably leading his girlfriend to Christ right now. No, I don't think you assume that. Uh, but we have this tendency to assume the worst. And, uh, and that will lead you nowhere. And if you act upon that assumption, you will be counted amongst the fools. Uh, through presumption comes nothing but strife. And so be very careful about that because you can ruminate in your mind what's going to happen. The world's coming apart. We're going to see uh, people having rebellion on the street. And we, and I said, stop that. <laughs> what you have is self-control. And every child of God can have that. That's how you walk by the Spirit during a time like this and have self-control. Even if the world flops around, nobody's out there is keeping you from being the person God created you to be. And that's the stability that we have in Christ, and that's God's will for your life. Become the responsible parent, spouse, or child that God wants you to be. Responsible uh, cafe owner. Take care of your people. Don't look out for your own interests. Uh, when Paul says these things remain, faith, hope, and love, understand that hope is really kind of like the parent of faith. You don't step out in faith if you have no hope. If you believe that uh, you're getting bad data, but I'm going to step out in faith and believe in, even though I know it's bad data, that's foolishness. If something is proven to be unreliable, don't trust it. That's not responsible thinking. And so hope, we have a God of all hope. Hope is not wishful thinking, folks. It's the present assurance of some future good. Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 repeats the same verse three times. Why are you in despair, oh my soul? Why is your countenance down? Hope in God, for he shall again worship him. The help of my countenance. Go back to God. Uh, the first thing you do about anything in a crisis is pray. One person said, you can live 40 days without food. You can live seven days without water, seven minutes without air, but you can't live a moment without hope. Hope is the basis for our living, and it's all based and rooted in the character of God. Uh, Even though you slay me, yet shall I live. Uh, what we have today as children of God is eternal life. Totally separate from the concept of this physical life that we're living right now, which can come today and be gone tomorrow. But what we have is eternal. Uh, security is not rooted in temporal things that we have no right or ability to control. Security is rooted in the eternal that never changes. And that's what you have, eternal life. And lastly, faith, hope, and love. Love is not sentimentality. Love is not really, in one sense, even a feeling. It, it really is the character of God. God is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't seek its own. Love considers the other person more important than yourself. If, if somehow all of society would grab hold of that and believe just that one verse and live it by faith, that have this interest, which was also in Christ, that he did nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but consider the other person more important than yourself. You're going to see selfishness rule by non-faithful people, unfortunately, that's pretty predictable. And, and people are going to take advantage of this and, and try to make money off of it and, and, and play the blame game and call it racist and all oh, just unbelievable garbage you, you're going to hear. But the true believer during this time is going to pick up the phone and call somebody they haven't seen for a couple of days and ask how they're doing. The mature person is, is going to look out and assume responsibility for their family and what God has given them. When you cast your anxiety upon Christ, you don't cast your responsibility on him. He'll throw it back. And, and that's proper, and that's what it should be. 
But it's a time when we see what is the most loving, responsible thing that I can do. And I need to start with myself, take care of myself. Uh, people out there are somewhat dependent upon me, and I've got to assume that responsibility. It's like flying on an airplane. And when they say, with the air, when they think on the, uh, the air comes down, put it on yourself first before you put it on your child. That's loving your neighbor as yourself. It's going to be assumed that you're going to assume responsibility for taking care of yourself because then you're better able to take care of other people. So this is a time when it's going to re reveal the character of our community. It's fascinating that just two weeks ago here in Tennessee, uh, 25 people, I think, eventually were killed by tornadoes. And... Uh, we're in the Bible Belt here. The church has responded and I'm opening them up for, for refugees. And it, it, it's fun to watch that. It's like the grid flood we had several years ago when 15 inches of rain came. The community just came together. And, and a lot of that, and people, everybody they talked to said, thank God for the church. Thank God for faith in God. But there's a lot of godliness in our country as well that are, aren't going to cooperate and, and perceive that way. Well, don't judge them, folks. Don't, don't be critical of them. Don't blame them. They don't know the Lord. This may be a time during a crisis when we see a lot of people come to Christ if the true Christian will show love and maturity during this time and let their faith be revealed, what it is that we really believe. Am I afraid? No, I'm not. I, I, fear has never really been a major issue for me. I have no fear of death. I look forward to seeing God someday. You know, I'm trusting him in the right timing for that. I may have a few good years left where I can serve other folks. And that's what I'll seek to do. So I'm going to be responsible and take care of myself. But truth of the matter is, <laughs> fear is not going to control my life. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So as we go through this crisis together, God's here. He's not caught by surprise. You're going to see a lot of anger and depression and fear and anxiety. It's a time to minister. It's harvest time during a crisis. It's like when I lived in California. Every time we had an earthquake, church attendance went up about 25% for one or two weeks. And then they kind of fall back again. I said, let's stay the course. Let's, let's finish the race. Make sure your faith remains. I don't know what tomorrow has. I know God does. And so my trust, my confidence is in him. I hope you have the same belief. It's your faith that counts right now. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your prayerful support of Freedom in Christ Ministries. All of our content is made possible by you. Your generous support and financial gifts make these videos and our ministry possible. For more information on how to support our ministry, please visit www.freedominchrist.org and click Get Involved.